Let me give you an introduction to neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are endogenous chemical messengers. By endogenous, I mean that they're compounds that the body produces itself. They're released at the synapse and they produce a response in the target cell. And there are lots of neurotransmitters. We think that there are probably as many as a hundred substances that can act as neurotransmitters. Here I've shown you the structure of some of the compounds that we know act as neurotransmitters in vertebrates. We can divide neurotransmitters into four broad classes. These are small molecules, neuropeptides, gaseous molecules, and endocannabinoids. Let's look at them one by one. Some of the most familiar neurotransmitters belong to the class called the small molecule neurotransmitters. This group includes glutamate, the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, GABA, the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, and glycine, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter common in the spinal cord. Now, as it happens, these three molecules are amino acids, and so this trio gets the name amino acid transmitters. Another small molecule is acetylcholine. Now, this is an amino acid transmitter, but it belongs to the group of small molecule neurotransmitters. There's another group of small molecule neurotransmitters, collectively called the monoamines. This group includes dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, as well as serotonin, melatonin, and histamine. To make things a little bit more complicated, three of these, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, are also known as the catecholamines. And if that weren't complicated enough, there are other small molecules, such as adenosine, that are also classified in this group. Each of these small molecule neurotransmitters has some unique features in how they work. I've talked about some of these transmitters, such as glutamate and GABA and acetylcholine elsewhere. Here I want to talk about some of the basic properties that all small molecule neurotransmitters share. Small molecule neurotransmitters are synthesized and packaged into vesicles at the axon terminal. They'll be released when an action potential arrives, opening voltage-gated calcium channels, this then involves a fusion of the two membranes. Once released into the cleft, the neurotransmitter has several fates. The neurotransmitter can bind to ionotropic receptors, ion channels, on the postsynaptic cells, either depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the cell. Neurotransmitter can also bind to metabotropic receptors and can activate cell signaling cascades. And neurotransmitter can bind to autoreceptors on the presynaptic membrane and provide feedback to the presynaptic cell about how much neurotransmitter is being released. Excess neurotransmitters are moved from the cleft by reuptake transporters. These are found in the presynaptic cells as well as in glial cells, and the small molecules are then repackaged in the terminal so that they can be used over and over again. The second broad class of neurotransmitters are neuropeptides. They are a diverse group of more than 50 small proteins. Well, how small is small? Here are a couple examples. Oxytocin and bradykinin are both nine amino acids long. You can actually see this for oxytocin where the individual amino acids are indicated. Glycine, leucine, proline, cysteine. Those are the amino acids, and these really are literally small proteins. These structures that I'm showing you are a little bit misleading because small molecules like this tend to ball up and form globular shapes. We see this in this molecule here, substance P another neuropeptide, 11 amino acids long. Some peptide transmitters are a little bit larger and they're big enough that they can adopt shapes that we see in other proteins. So for example, neuropeptide Y, which is 37 amino acids long, has an alpha helix. Here's a goody related peptide at 112 amino acids long, and you can see beta pleated sheets. There's a tremendous diversity of neuropeptides but they're all synthesized and act in a similar way. So neuropeptides are small proteins, and what that means is that they're going to be synthesized in the soma. This process is going to involve ribosomes and the rough ER. Remember that the soma might be 1 centimeter, might be 10 centimeter, it might be 50 centimeters away from the nerve terminal. So this is quite different from what we saw with the small molecule neurotransmitters. The proteins are sorted and packaged into vesicles in the Golgi, and these vesicles are very densely packed. They're so dense that with electron microscopy, the vesicles actually look dark. 
These densely packed vesicles, or called dense core vesicles, then need to be transported to the actual site of release. So this process involves molecular motors and microtubules, and they have to be walked all the way down to the nerve terminal. Once there, they'll be available for release when an action potential arrives. Most neurons that release peptide transmitters also contain a cotransmitter, so that there are also vesicles that contain a small, classic neurotransmitter. These vesicles look different. They tend to be clear, and they're not as densely packaged as the ones that contain the protein. There are a couple important differences in how they act as well. For example, when the peptide hormones are released, they bind to their receptor, and that peptide and receptor complex is taken into the cell, where it will then be degraded. In contrast, when a small molecule is released, it can be reabsorbed by a reuptake transporter and then repackaged at the site. Another difference between the peptide transmitters and the small molecule transmitters is that peptide-filled vesicles require high-frequency action potential train for release. There needs to be a strong amount of activity in the presynaptic cell for those dense core vesicles to fuse. In contrast, even one or two action potentials arriving at the terminal will allow small, clear vesicles filled with the classic neurotransmitters to be released. Let's look at gaseous molecules. By far the best characterized is nitric oxide, NO, and I want to stress that nitric oxide is not the same as nitrous oxide, which you might have encountered at a dental appointment as an anesthetic. Gaseous transmitters like NO are not normally present at the cell. And they need to be synthesized. For NO, the precursor molecule is arginine. And if an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, NO synthase, is activated, then that arginine will be converted into citrulline and also generate NO. NO is a small gas. It's very soluble, and it will diffuse away from the cell. Thus, Nitric oxide can act in the cell itself, but it can also act in the presynaptic input, it can act in a neighboring neuron, it can even act on astrocytes. I'll show you some of the actions of NO in the cell itself. So what can NO do? Well, one thing that NO can do is there's an enzyme called guanylyl cyclase, which can be activated by NO. This is an enzyme that takes GTP and then converts it into a molecule called cyclic GMP which acts as an intracellular messenger within the cell. There are cyclic nucleotide-gated channels, which when cyclic GMP binds to them, will open or close. In addition, there's a protein called protein kinase G, which, when bound by cyclic GMP, becomes activated. Protein kinase G is known to phosphorylate sodium channels, calcium channels, and potassium channels. And so by activating NO, we can change the activity of this green neuron. The question then is, how then is NO, the enzyme, activated? And there's more than one way to do this. At glutaminergic synapses, NO synthase is closely associated with NMDA receptors. So remember, NMDA receptors are a classic glutamate receptor with a magnesium block. If the magnesium block is removed, then when glutamate is released and binds to it, calcium comes into the cell. And it's this influx of calcium through NMDA channels which activates the NO synthase molecule. So now it can take arginine and produce NO. Nitric oxide can have different effects depending on its concentration. At low concentrations, NO is generally thought to be beneficial, but at high concentrations, NO can be harmful. The last class of neurotransmitter are endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are the endogenous molecules that can bind to the receptors that are targeted by cannabis. The two best known endocannabinoids are 2-arachidinoyl glycerol, 2-AG, and anarachidinoyl ethanolamine, also called anandamine or AEA. What I want you to notice about these compounds is that they feature long hydrocarbon chains. Both of these molecules have a set of 18 carbons, and this long hydrocarbon chain reflects the origin of these molecules, the active transmitters generated when membrane lipids are cleaved to create these molecules. Let me walk you through that process. Remember that in membranes there are a lot of phospholipids. 
Here's the structure of one of the phospholipids that we might find. This is phosphatidylinositol, and this is a precursor molecule for 2-AG. If an enzyme called phospholipase C is activated, it will clip the molecule here, forming DAG and an acetyl phosphate. And if another enzyme called diacylglycerol ligase is activated, it can clip here. And the resulting molecule is 2-AG. There's a different pathway involving a different precursor molecule and different enzymes that can generate AEA, an anamine. Let's talk about how endocannabinoids work. Well, endocannabinoids typically act as retrograde messengers. This is really different from what we've seen so far. So what does this mean? Suppose that we've got a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic neuron here. If that presynaptic cell has an action potential, it can release neurotransmitter and it might bind to a receptor, say a metabotropic glutamate receptor, that in turn can activate an intracellular cascade. This is one of the ways that we can activate the enzymes that are needed to take a precursor molecule and then produce the endocannabinoid. The endocannabinoid, once it's generated, diffuses back across the cleft and binds to cannabinoid receptors on the presynaptic cell membrane. These are called the cannabinoid 1 and 2 class of receptors, and as I've drawn them, you can see that they are members of the GPCR family. And typically what happens is these then inhibit neurotransmitter release. So it's a bit of a feedback loop where it's feeding back in a retrograde manner onto the presynaptic neuron. Now I should say that the endocannabinoids can also diffuse away and interact with receptors on astrocytes and on other neighboring neurons. So they don't always act as a retrograde messenger, but typically that's the way that we think about them working. All neurotransmitters need a way to be deactivated. For the endocannabinoids, the process involves some enzymes. For example, for an anamide, there's an enzyme called FAAH, fatty acid amide hydrolase, which can clip the molecule to generate arachidonic acid and ethanolamine. There's a similar enzyme called monoamine glycerol lipase that clips 2-AG to form arachidonic acid and glycerol. In either case, the arachidonic acid can be recycled to form new endocannabinoids. When I drew the cartoons for this video, I tried to keep it simple. So for each one of the classes of neurotransmitters, I basically only showed you the events that would occur related to that particular compound. But things are more complicated in real life because neurons receive multiple neurotransmitters from multiple different presynaptic inputs. Let me give you a specific example. Your body surface is studded with sensory receptors that provide information about temperature, about touch, and about pain. One set of these are pain sensory neurons and they send their axons into the spinal cord where they can make synapses onto projection neurons in the spinal cord. If activated, this projection neuron would carry that information up to the brain. The primary sensory neurons, these blue neurons here, release both glutamate as well as substance P. So there are co-transmitters there with a peptide neurotransmitter and a classic neurotransmitter. The projection neurons in the spinal cord then must have receptors for both glutamate but also for substance P. And when this synapse is activated, it will tend to excite the projection neuron. But projection neurons also receive input from local interneurons with the neurotransmitter glycine, which when it binds to receptor, inhibits the projection interneurons. There are also descending neurons. These are neurons whose cell bodies lie in the brainstem. Some of these neurons release serotonin, which when it binds to its receptor, can then modulate activity in the projection neuron. And if that weren't complicated enough, there are other interneurons that can modulate the activity of the presynaptic cell. So for example, there are neurons that can release GABA and enkephalin that will keep them then from exciting the projection interneurons. In addition, remember that cells can produce endocannabinoids and they can also produce gaseous neurotransmitters. So the activity in the projection neuron will depend on the balance of all of these different inputs and all of these different neurotransmitters. Disruptions in the balance of neurotransmitters at this synapse can lead to clinical conditions such as neuropathic pain. There are similar systems elsewhere in the brain. In other brain regions, changes in the balance of neurotransmitters can lead to changes in mood, for example, leading to feelings of anxiety or depression or of pleasure. 
Most drugs, and by drug I mean both pharmacological agents as well as by street drugs, but most drugs that affect the brain target one of these neurotransmitter systems. For this reason, there's a lot of research onto neurotransmitters and the way that they modulate activity in the brain.